and do you record these as well or just do the live stream? Uh, I do the live stream. I can, we can do a recording do, 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 just to. Sharing pleasure too. Okay. We are live. As I'm doing all this, we are live. Right. You are tagged. And yeah, so I don't have like fancy music and stuff as we went. We're just live. We're here. Okay. Welcome to Rewriting Reality. I am Shiraz. And we've got a great guest here. We have Josiah Cooper from Expert Sessions, which is uh, a lot more than just Expert Sessions. He's gonna talk to us about that and regale us with a reality shifting moment in his life. So uh, actually, you know, let's, let's start right there. So this is Rewriting Reality. Tell us about that moment or a big moment in you where Things were going a certain way and you needed that big reality shift. How did it happen? What took place? Let's get right into it. All right. Well, just dive on in. First of all, thank you, Shiraz, for uh, having me on here. You uh, have, I'm not, you have or I have, one of us has the distinct honor of this being my first time in the hot seat, actually, uh, here on a podcast I've been hosting now for, uh, for some time, but uh, this is my first I'm being on the the other end, so this is um, a really fun experience. I'm really excited for our conversation today. So uh, probably one of the, the things that comes to mind when you ask me about um, a key reality shift for me was probably when my career early on got kind of turned upside down. Um, I was in a, a position with a company that I had really pursued and was, was working with them and had gotten into a position that just, it didn't light me up. And it, it, it wasn't like feeding my, my goals and how I felt that I was of value and all of this. And um, that job went away <laughs> it just left me and it was like, hey, uh, thanks and happy trails and good luck. <laughs> and and that really was was kind of, shocking for me how and then and I was almost like in in the, the moment and in the time frame that it was was happening it was almost like I was aware on a subconscious level that like I was creating this experience of this job leading me or being and it was just job as it the were. job is just gone and there's no job to replace it you're just gone it's done yeah yeah, it was, you know, I, I hadn't, I didn't consider, because there, there was a part of me that was like, okay, this will all work out. We know we had some conversations. These are some improvements we'd like to see made and things like that with my superiors. Um, but in, in, in a way, it was like, okay, well, I didn't put energy towards maybe finding something just in case things didn't go my way to fall back on. Um, and at the same time, I was aware that like, I really wasn't putting any energy towards or, or doing better or anything like this. Okay. So I was kind of subconsciously aware that I was creating that for myself. So what was the mental state there? Was it just, okay, what's going on? Or was it like, oh my God, I don't have work. What the hell am I gonna do? <laughs> Where were you in that space? I'll be honest, for most people, when they, that, that's, those are the first thoughts that go through their mind when they get fired, right? Is how am I going to pay the bills? How am I going to, you know, what am I going to do for work? Because it's like work and paying bills, unfortunately, for a lot of people is all we know. Yeah. And in my experience, I honestly felt, I, I breathed the deep sigh when I walked out of that building oh, wow. and I went out to the parking lot and I sat in my car. And it was just like this weight was taken off because I was like, oh, okay, I can do anything from here. 
And then I, I sat for a couple minutes and I was like, okay, I need to, you know, reduce the payments to minimum monthly payment. I need to cancel the subscription, you know, something like that, you know, <laughs> find a new place to live and some of the logistical things that, that, you know, need to be done. Uh, and in terms of what I had saved to live on until I find the next thing, but it was almost, yeah, it was like, it was this sense of freedom that I felt. That's neat because that's not usually people's experience when the job goes away. And I know for me, no. personally, no. when the job went away the first time, it was, I, first of all, I wasn't thinking like you. I was thinking a job will come. So I didn't reduce the payments. I didn't do it. I was still spending at the level of expecting the job to come. And it, and it turned out to be two years before the job actually came. So <laughs> that's great. So I'm giving you kudos on this because you took the right step. <laughs> but but at, the other thing was, I was just like, at the beginning, I was like, okay, job's going to come. And then it didn't. Okay, something's going to okay, I'm panicking now. Ah, right. So what was your, because you, you started off fine. You started off doing all the right things. What happened then? Um, well, I had, and then the way my, my life was situated, I still had like a month left at the, the house I was renting at the time. Mm -hmm. And so I didn't, I wasn't like, well, I need to go somewhere else. It wasn't like that was leaving me. I had that space. And, and in that time, um, kind of took that month for myself to kind of do some soul searching, do some, some cleanup, if you will. But then I moved all my stuff out and I went and traveled for like three, three months and and exploring and adventure is very important to me. And that was something that I didn't have the freedom to do as much as I wanted to while I was still in, in the reality of having a job. And it's one of those things that I realized that a lot of people, when they, they have the money to do something, they don't have the time. <laughs> when they have the time to do something, they don't have money. Yeah. And I was like, okay, well, I have a little bit of, of both right now. <laughs> um, and then after I traveled for two months or so, or three, uh, I started kind of coming into that, the yellow zone <laughs> and going, okay, let's... Um, you know, let's, let's see what, what changes here. And it was one of those things where I had to get clear on what I wanted. And I, you know, I'm updating my resume and applying for, for jobs and stuff like this. But I realized that what I wanted wasn't being reflected on my resume. Because on my resume, I was doing all the, you know, checking out the boxes. What was your last appointment? What was your last position? Things like this. And my last position was a position that I didn't want. It was a position I got fired from. <laughs> <laughs> and it's like my dad telling me, you need to put the position that you want to be hired for in as, you know, whatever closes that was to, you know, your actual experience uh, in that. Okay. So that reality had to, <laughs> to align yeah. and um, a really amazing opportunity. Or it found me actually, I should say, at that point around um, in the summer of that year. And uh and so I got fired back in January and then it was Ju like late June when um, whoever reached out to me with an opportunity and I'm still doing, I'm still working with that, that gig, if you will, today. Okay. And you still, you're still traveling because when we got introduced, it was through a networking event that we both go to. And the thing I found amusing is that every time you came in to that networking event, they'd ask where you were and that, that, word you would use the location would often change and i'm like okay who is this guy what's going on he's <laughs> always in a different place <laughs> yeah yeah i think um probably the first time i was on with you i was in guatemala um i've been on in florida and texas and, and all kinds of places and that's one of the beautiful things about creating um my own reality is that when, when this opportunity came my way, it's given me the opportunity between work assignments and doing work that I'm, I'm good at and that I enjoy, it's given me the freedom to go out and travel, explore and attend events and and also you know build the things that I wanna create in this world and make the impact that I wanna make as well. See, and this is, this is one of the reasons that I wanted you on the show because there's so many people out there with the mindset that I've gotta do my job, save, and then go travel. 
and you're busy traveling and getting paid for it while also working on things that are really important to you as you're doing all of this. And a lot of people have that mindset that, well, no, you can't, that's, that's too hard, or it has to be separate things. There's no way you could all combine and you can just create that lifestyle. So what took you from where you were at that job all the way into this, this lifestyle you created for yourself? A lot of it really had to do with expressing what I wanted. It's really, you know, being clear on that because when the way that my, my job works is I work in construction project management and I oversee certain aspects of a project until it's completed. Well, when it's completed, if there's none of the project coming down the pipeline for me to, to join and rinse and repeat, so to speak, there's a space of time between those. And I had the, the freedom and the flexibility and the opportunity to say, hey, you know, once I'm done with this project, let me know what's coming up down the line because I want this time for myself to be able to go and, and do the things, whether I'm skiing in Colorado <laughs> or rock climbing in Guatemala or whatever I'm doing, um, attending a climatog certification course, <laughs> you know, where I get to really enhance the things that I love doing in terms of, um, just as a faith holder, as a healer, as a coach, as a guide, all kinds of things. And really getting to enhance those experiences in life to be able to bring and enhance who I am and how I show up. And so communicating that and saying, you know, rather than stepping out of the box, it's interesting. I just made a post the other day mm -hmm. and said, there is no box. Mm -hmm. But we look at it like there's a box. Like, okay, well, you know, if, if I'm not you know, if I, if I'm, if this is my end date, I need a really close start date because that's where we have our idea of, of security. Yeah. And that's where our, our reality is so conditioned to think that like, well, we have to be employed all the time and we can actually strategize and we can budget and we can do these, these creative models for ourselves that really support what we want to do. Um, if we give ourselves the permission to actually want to do it, we want what we want. That's, that's so true. And a lot of people want it, but aren't going after it. They're not taking the steps. And just the, what you said, when you're talking about time, I know with you, it's the time the the gaps that you get, that you use to do whatever you want to do. But overall with the time, I, I had a conversation with a friend the other day and he brought up a really interesting technique that people use. And it really starts to get you motivated. And what you do is you figure out what date you're gonna die. You just estimate, okay, I'm gonna die when I'm 120 and uh, we'll call it you know, July 7th of, the, of that year. And you figure out how many days that is. And then you write that day on your, the number of days left on your hand and every day you update it. So you've got this countdown timer that you look at on your hand and you said, this is how much time I have left to get the shit done that I really want to do. Why am I wasting my time with other things? <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. And I'm there, there's so much different conversation around such things as, um, you know, working on someone else's dream and making someone else rich mm -hmm. and, and these kinds of things. And I, I think I would say that that's probably not the most beneficial approach mm -hmm. um, because if you, you can be doing the things that you love doing and it, and that'd be okay and be getting paid for it. And, you know, and someone else is and it's, it's in support of someone else's goal, so to speak. Yeah. Um, but there is what it speaks to, I think, is a great disenchantment, <laughs> to say the least, <laughs> with the, the rat race, the way of, of doing life and the conditioning that we've been been given to, you know, work, 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 hustle, 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 and all that kind of a thing. And and I'm seeing so much more um, in social media and just the conversation lately has, has been like, look, productivity is not the end all be all. You know, your, your value as a human is not directly related to what you can produce a number. 
in some empirical format. And I think we've gotten away from that a lot, um, especially here as you know, technology has given us the ability to produce more and do more and, and all these things. And we have you know, all the different strategies for time management, which is another conversation. You can't manage time. Mm -hmm. But we, we tie our, our value so much to our productivity. And then we put a label on that of, you know, well, I'm a doctor or I'm a lawyer or I'm a nurse or I'm a, um, or, you know, whatever, whatever these things are and, and, and say, well, okay, I'm valuable because I hold this position and, and there's productivity tied to it. And, and there's some value somehow arbitrarily tied to that. It's like, no, you're, you're valuable as a person, you're valuable as a human and what you do with your own journey is just a bonus. Hopefully you're helping out your fellow man and not doing <laughs> doing a lot of harm. Okay. So my, my question to you then is for those people that that don't seem to get it because for when you say it, it seems sort of straightforward, you're valuable as a human. But a lot of people have been brought up with that. You have to have a skill to be valuable. You have to help this many people or make this much money. So what advice would you give? Or how would you want them to reframe that so that they see their own value? Learn to love yourself. And that's another thing that we've been taught so much is that loving yourself is somehow selfish and there's something wrong with, with self-love. And it's been part of my own journey in, in differentiating self-love from being selfish. And because when, if we're being selfish, it's, it's all about me and what can I get and, and, and creating a sense of value around the things that I have. It, it's very materialistic. Um, and, and I say materialistic in terms of even um, social capital, shall we say, um, just as much as it is as it's physical thing. And, and that's very different from self-love, which is like having hold of the awareness that I am valuable as a human being. I am, I am made and created with intrinsic value. And what is it that's going to light me up, fill me up, make me happy, for lack of a better word, but also make me feel like I am living the life that I meant to live. And I asked someone actually just yesterday um, of like you know, what their what their ideal would be for life. And one of the things they mentioned was was mental stability. Well, you don't want to be stable or do you want to be flourishing? <laughs> like what's <laughs> you know, stable is just like oh, I'm doing okay. And and Sure, I'll compete when you, you, you cross people every day, you know, and they ask you, how are you doing? What's the first answer you get most of the time? Fine. Doing okay. <laughs> doing okay. I'm, I'm holding up. Living the dream, right? We have these just like these things we put out there. Yeah. But it's it's this like baseline, right? We're kind of flatlined of, of okay. Yeah. You know, and I said, well, flourishing to me looks like really understanding myself really understanding why I tick the way I do. What are the things that trigger me? What are the things that excite me? How am I being conscious in my, in my conversations and my relationships that I'm not acting out of maybe a past hurt or I'm, I'm not expecting other people to do things that's not realistic? And, and how am I taking care of myself so I'm, I'm fed spiritually, I'm fed physically? I'm taking care of my, my diet, my exercise, and taking care of this, this body that I get in until whatever those, those days are <laughs> that we wrote down, um, you know, that I no longer inhabit this body. And when we look at, at self-love that way, it really peels back the veil, I think, from the title and the labels that we put on all the different things that say, well, I'm valuable because I make this much money or I have this kind of job title or I drive this kind of car or I have these kinds of assets or I wear this clothes, wear these shoes. Fill them. Mm -hmm. Okay. I just, and I, and I completely agree with what, what you're saying here. I know that 
there's a lot of people that have that programming that you're talking about getting rid of from their parents. You know, you'll never amount to anything or, um, or being put down in high school by, by teachers, or by other people. And so they want to get out of that. They want to feel uh, valued. And this seems to be like a big thing for you to know your own value. So in a world, and I know it's just like, you got to get into that and, and feel that what your value is in a world where it is a lot of people throwing judgments on you, trying to devalue you, trying to make you feel bad so they can feel better and, and increase their value, so to speak. Do you have any ways that you get beyond that and, and just enjoy your value and stay, stay centered, stay grounded in it? So what you're asking is how do you deal with the haters, right? <laughs> okay, that's the easy way of putting it. <laughs> and, and the, the uh, that's one way to put it. And obviously not everybody that's responsible for the conditioning we've received are haters. A lot of them actually feel like they're, they mean what's best for us. Mm -hmm. And, and a lot of them want what's best for us, but they're, they're projecting from their own fears and insecurities of, you know, oh, you don't have a job. What will you do? How will you support your family? Right. And they put on us this kind of, of judgment. And, and thinking from that box of like, well, if, if this doesn't exist, then, then this can't exist. And, and then they, they attach these labels. And so stepping away from that, um, like I said before, it sounds so simple when I just say, you know, love yourself. Mm -hmm. That sounds great. But what well, when you actually lean, like, again, peel back the, the curtain, look, you know, look behind the, the, the curtain, as they say in, in the Wizard of Oz, and look at the inner working of what actually makes this reality. Yeah. It's like, no, it's, it's work, you know, because you have to, um, you may have to step away from relationships. You may have to step away from people who, while they, they might want what's best for you, they don't know what's best for you. And one of the, one of the things that I, I heard, I've heard it before and I heard it again recently was, don't take advice from people who aren't where you want to be. Mm -hmm. So as far as the people who, you know, who are projecting their expectations onto you, um, you know, are they where you want to be? Are they living a life that you would want to live? Are they flourishing in their relationships or are they stagnant? Are they, you know, experiencing a lot of intimacy with their partner or are they not? Are they experiencing life in terms of what you want? If it's travel, if it's, contribution if it's you know added value wherever you go are they experiencing that or are they not and if they're not you know you have to gracefully graciously i'll say mm -hmm. back away and i realized that the more that i the more that i begin to resonate with the things that i, I shared earlier about like these these tenets if you will of self-love and and knowing myself better I start attracting more and more people that are doing the same things and the ones that aren't or that have no interest in doing that kind of fade away. Okay. All right. So I'm, I'm very curious. And then there's going to be the haters and they're always going to be out there. Oh, yeah. <laughs> but I'm very curious now because we've got expert sessions in there. And it says coaching at sharpshooter enterprises. But when you talked about what you were doing, you were saying construction. So it sounds like there's more than, than just construction going on in your life. <laughs> because you're also yes. giving all this great coaching advice. So I'm assuming coaching might be in there somewhere. Um, so tell, what else is going on? Well, um, and that was kind of, kind of one of the things that I've, I've always been good at or at least had a passion for, and I've, I've had to receive a lot of, of training and coaching myself to really hone in on where can I direct these passions of mine in the most effective way. And I've always loved sharing information and sharing truth and helping people become the best version of themselves that they could be. I remember when I was taking Taekwondo and this was many years ago, but I was just a yellow belt. And if you're familiar with Taekwondo martial arts in and of itself, yellow belt is not very 
high on the ranks. <laughs> I've been doing it for maybe six months. Well, we had a new, a new white belt come in and they were learning some move, some movement, some sequence. And I was just so passionate about helping them that I started like sharing with them some of the things that I was learning that they weren't ready for. Oh. Just because I was so caught up in it. One of the instructors had to say, hey, you know, remember when you didn't know this? <laughs> That's where they are. <laughs> and I've been cultivating from my own experiences and from others' experiences, as they say, the, uh, the wise may learn from others' mistakes. Mm-hmm. And, and taking what people have done well, taking what people have not done well, and leveraging it to best meet people where they are help them achieve their, their highest and best. So that's where the, the coaching comes from. I do personal coaching. I'm actually just, I'm still launching it. Now we're still building it actually, um, a new paradigm for leadership in construction. And I realized that when you have poor leadership that is fueled by, hmm, how do I put this in a politically correct sense? The immature masculine (laughs) and in terms of what you see a lot of in such a very male dominated industry like construction Mm -hmm. you're going to get a lot of ego showing up anger showing up and a lot of these kinds of attitudes that aren't conducive to safety productivity and and things like that and it was one of those epiphanies that came to me of grow where you're planted and i realized that well, I'm planted in the construction industry, you know, and then that's what I know. And there's also this opportunity for this amazing symbiosis of the personal development work that I've done. I think, you know, Tony Robbins, Les Brown, these kinds of, of people with going to help people not only perform better in terms of, of their job and their work and the things that we're creating in the world, the infrastructure that we're developing and the hospitals we're building and and the homes that we're creating and, and all of this kind of a thing. But these are skills and things that they can take back to their homes. And I think that's what's really, really beautiful about this is when when you, you share with someone how to navigate their emotional states mm-hmm. and how when, when I realized that a 45 second conversation that I had with someone on a job site could have saved hours of time lots of money, you know, possible, you know, safety issues and things like this, just from letting someone have the time to say, I'm, I'm not feeling top today. And, and me being able to hold a space for them of, Hey, you know, take five, get some water, take a, you know, breathe yep. and, and then come back and, and, you know, take this on at your own pace you know, had such a different outcome than, well, we don't have time to waste and we got to get this done right now. And, you know, if you can all find someone who can, right? That attitude's not going to go where you want it to go. Mm-hmm. So when people take this opportunity and they learn about how to navigate their own emotions, how to read, how to communicate what's going on, how to have the freedom to express what's really going on. And is it possible that if they can do that on a job site and they can do that in the home Mm -hmm. and when they're in the home and when they're with their spouse and their children or their parents or their whoever else that's going to that's going to trickle down into every other aspect of their life and we're able to fundamentally change at the atomic level (laughs) so to speak Mm -hmm. the consciousness of the people who are receiving this kind of thing so that time it's, it's interesting because I, I love what you're saying, but something's just sort of sticking out with me right now. And it's just the, the way you said it just made some, made my, my brain go, oh, look at that. Um, because it was about talking to the white belt at the level the white belt can understand. And I've noticed that like, I've, I've sort of like, I, I teach people how to do energetic magic. So I've got the different levels, one, two, and three. So that's taking you through, but it just made me go, well, where else in my practice should I be doing that, that I'm not doing that where, and I, I noticed that in other coaching programs too. It's like, here it is, work on this. Here's the lessons or here's the modules and work on it. But some people might not even be ready for that. You don't know exactly where they are, but it sounds like you're taking that time to see 
where it is, what can I teach them that they're ready to learn versus not ready to learn? And that's that's a remarkable skill to have because I, I see a lot of people just doing co cookie cutter lessons out there. And if you can keep up, you can't, you keep up. And if you can't, then you're just lost. So I like, is that is that really like going into everything you do? Because it's that, I mean, <laughs> I've probably heard it, but now just hearing it from you, it's just like, it just went, something went, ah, okay, you've got to re-examine your whole fucking business now <laughs> and, and see what's going on and see if you can implement this in a different way. <laughs> right? Yeah, yeah. And that says one of the things that um, I find a lot of people are, are frustrated with, right? It's just like, oh, elevate your consciousness, love yourself, you know, all these different kinds of things. But if you're not in that kind of a space, it's a whole different vocabulary for one thing, mm -hmm. right? It is just like, well, okay, first of all, what is consciousness and why does it need to be elevated? And what's wrong with the way I'm doing business now? <laughs> you know? And yeah. you have to really break it down. It's like, well, okay, what did you mean? And it's a skill. It, it really is because there, there's, there's trans information and then there's communication. Mm -hmm. Oh, you just froze. And you're back. <laughs> Okay. So, where, did, where did you lose me? Uh, I think you said there's uh, transfer of information and this communication or something to that effect. And then we just lost you completely. Mm -hmm. Right. And then communication is, is the situation in which what is understood meets what is being said. Okay. And so I guess- And, and very often transfer. you'll have people in- Is most of the time it's just transfer information. Yeah, and you see a lot of that in education. Okay. Right. And, and you see that a lot in um, like relationship counseling and things like this, where it's like, oh, well, he said this and she understood that and they did not match up. Yeah. <laughs> it's um, what's the classic where, uh, you know, the wife says to her husband, hey, you know, go to the store and, uh, and get milk. And if they have, have eggs you get a dozen and he comes back with a dozen jugs of milk yes <laughs> said, well they had eggs so i got a dozen <laughs> milks <laughs> yeah not what i meant and it's a humorous story but but that kind of communication breakdown happens all the time mm -hmm. and I, I figure it is because there's different forms of communication going on so that can be something that's difficult to navigate So absolutely. What would you what would you say in in dealing with the different types of communication? How to how to be understood without being um, without without causing the the dissonance, without the people getting upset, but still getting your point across. How what kind of advice would you have around that? A lot of it comes from, well, first of all, active listening. Mm -hmm. And, and it's, it's a skill that I am consistently developing because really understanding where they're coming from. Like, are they asking the question that they're saying or are they asking a different question, but phrasing it in a way where maybe there's some, some hesitancy? Some vulnerability that they're not ready to lean into yet and just being with that and like okay well well this is where it is and you know what's what, what's not being said and or what's being said that's that's more than the words they're saying so that would be the first step is that active listening and then again recognizing like okay are they white belt are they green belt are they black belt in whatever the the topic of conversation is and am I just going to completely lose them with my vocabulary in, in this particular yep. topic of conversation, uh, be it, be it jargon or be it, you know, concepts that they're completely unfamiliar with because you can tell a, um, you can tell two different people the same instructions 
-hmm. you know, I'll relate it back to, to doing work on, on the job site. Right. And you can tell somebody, Hey, go move that equipment from here to there. And the guy that knows how to operate the equipment is going to go move the equipment. The guy that's never been in the operator seat is going to be like, what do you mean move it? Do I need to pick it up with another piece of equipment and move it? Do I need to move it itself? Do you know all the things going on? So really taking the time to learn about the, the person, the people and, and the, the demographic or whatever that is, a psychograph even of who you're working with to be able to communicate to them in a way that they're going to understand. Because not everybody learns the same way. You have visual, you have auditory, you have kinesthetic, you have emotional learners. Um, and when you really are able to speak their language, um, that really becomes like your, your next level power. Yeah, I just, I just was reminded of the, this one comic I saw with like an elephant, a monkey, a turtle, and, uh, and I think a bird. And the instructor is like, we're going to see how competent you are and everyone go climb that tree. <laughs> and then it's just, uh, everyone's at a different space. Everyone's capable of different things and you have to, you have to meet them where they are. <laughs> so. Absolutely. And I think it was, it was Einstein that said, you know, everyone is, is equal, but if you judge a fish by its ability to climb a tree, it's going to grow life leaving it stupid. Yeah. <laughs> and that's my beef with standardized testing. Yeah. No, I've got the same, same issues there. There was actually a, um, a teacher, this was this really interesting in story from when we were in high school. We had this teacher come in and he had a completely different way of teaching. And he had things broken down by modules. And he said, here's all the work for the entire year. And it's in these modules and it's all packaged together so, I, so you can do it. And he said, when you're done all the modules and you've there's a test for every module, when you're done that, you no longer need to come to class. Also, we have a schedule for the modules. And if you're done with that particular module before the end of the schedule, then you don't no, no longer have to come to class. And we all went, what the hell is this guy doing? But then he started teaching the lesson and we got the modules and the people that were really good started to go ahead in the modules and finish the modules. And then they just stopped coming to class, right? But then the people that were in class were either at pace or behind. So he got to spend more time figuring out what they didn't know, how to teach them right. And so by the end of the year, everyone had marks in the 80s and 90s because he got the information across to everyone so that they all excelled at the exam. And so he got fired right? <laughs> because that's not how we teach, right? Oh, wow. Yeah, <laughs> it blew my mind. Because you're not letting, you're telling the kids wow. not to come to class. Wow. They're, they're, they're skipping Thank school. You. It's irresponsible. <laughs> wow. And, and that goes back, back to so something that I'm, I'm personally very passionate about. That is personal empowerment. Mm -hmm. Empower people to learn in the way that is going to best resonate with them. And so, you know, the students that, that excelled on their own, that was how they were empowered. But then the ones who, who needed that more hand-holding one-on-one time were able to get it. That's how they felt empowered to learn. And they all learned at the same, at the same rate, evidently. Yeah, and it was, it was just the same outcome. Time. Yeah, because at the, at the end, because everyone's in the 80s and 90s in a course, and it's usually a 60 with a bell curve, and that didn't match anything, obviously he was doing something wrong because the kids couldn't possibly all be that smart. <laughs> so. Gosh. That's insane. Yeah, and but again, this is it was it was great for me to get a taste of that. But then seeing this is the world we live in and how decisions are made, it's it's become really important for for me to know to let people know that they are valuable. They can accomplish anything they want. They just need to figure out how it works best for them to accomplish that. Not how do I fit into the mold and be like everyone else. Right. 
because when you come like everyone, then you're part of the system that fired the professor who was doing his job well. Absolutely. And that's the other half of it is that you know our systems are honestly designed for failure. <laughs> well, I don't know. Failure is the exact word, but definitely conformity. <laughs> so. Yes, definitely. I would, I would, I would agree with that. Yeah, but yeah, again, that was <laughs> that was the the design. That's exactly why it's set up the way it's. Put. I'm still waiting for that big shift in education where the model completely changes. And uh, I'd actually heard about one one school overseas that was trying the experience points model. So it's like if you're playing Dungeons and Dragons and you keep having experience and your character levels up, when you're doing different modules, you get experience points for completing the modules and you do the modules you want so you get experience in different fields and you go based on what you enjoy. So some people will naturally do math and keep gaining experience in math and then they realize they're gonna be a math expert by the time they come out of school. And if you do modules, there's no penalty for failing them. It's just like, this is not what you wanna do. Although you have to pass the base thing for just like reading level and being able to do basic math and stuff so you can function in society. But they said it's crazy because they've basically taken out the concept of failure and it's all growth and new experience. And people go into the world thinking that way too. If they can't do something, I'm not a failure. It's just, oh, I have to figure out how to do this so I can continue to make growth and experience. And I'm like, when is that model gonna be everywhere? <laughs> like seriously. Wow, no joke. <laughs> yeah, no, that, that's amazing. It's, on the one hand, you had yeah, you have this model that, that really celebrates growth and figuring out what you want to do. Um, on the other, how do you feel that it um, prefers it for the real world in which there is failure and associated consequences and, and things of that nature? Yeah, and the thing I, I found that's interesting is and. When we're when we're born, we don't we don't understand that failure is a bad thing, right? We're taught that, and so we have to get untaught that. And the example that that I love is when a kid tries to walk. There's never a kid that says, "Oh fuck, you know, screw it, I'm not going to walk anymore. It's just too hard. I feel like a failure." Like <laughs> you don't you don't see thirty year old uh, people out there saying, "You know, I just never learned to walk. It was too hard." Like it's just we we get taught. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah, very true. Okay. So yeah, fundamentally it's yeah. It's in our nature to so to speak, but if it's it's only not okay when it comes to what education. <laughs> mm -hmm. You know, at, at what point do we grow out of like, okay, it's okay to fall down, it's okay to fall off, it's okay to because you know, when I'm riding a bike, I didn't hop on an adult's bike. You know, mm -hmm. ready wheels are out, bicycle, <laughs> training wheels, <laughs> right? These kinds of things that, you know, help us to evolve. If you fall off the bike, it's, not, oh, well, I, I'll never ride a bike. I suck. Yeah. You know, we get back on and we, and we keep doing it. And then along the line, you know, now there's grades involved and there's numbers and there's some metric by which we succeed or fail. And, and that has consequences somehow. Mm -hmm. um, you know, whether we get the cookie or the popsicle or whatever it is. And, yeah. and then we become averse to failure because, okay, well, failure means, okay, I don't get the cookie and that's not so bad, but then that fear actually brings about a negative experience, right? Instead of, you know, not getting on being given a mud pie <laughs> or something. Yeah. And I, I think it was, I think it was Bob Proctor that taught me that when you take a test, it's not actually showing if you're good at that subject. It's showing what your mindset was at the time you took the test. Right. So mm. when you look at it that way, you're like, well, wait a sec, then why am I taking the test? Because if I'm having a really bad day, <laughs> like. Not a good day for a test. Yeah. Take a different exam day. Okay, I we have some people online and I just want to open it up. So if you have any questions for 
Josiah, and you want to pick his brain on something in your life. We've been talking about relationships, self-worth. Uh, you can raise your hand and we'll bring you up to have a conversation with him. And if not, then he and I are just going to keep jabbering away for another 10 minutes or so until we shut down the, store, the, the show. So no one's, I'll, I'll give it time for people to come up with something. So my next question to you was, is there any, is there any person in your life that you would say has had a big profound impact that is, that is giving you insights or giving you direction as to where you want to go with your life? Mm. A lot of guides along the way, for sure. Um, I've, I've always looked up to and respected my dad for being somebody who really pursued what he wanted to do. And also for the sacrifices that he made to, you know, pay the family and, and, and things like that. And it was this, inter this interesting balance um, just observing his, his life and story. And, um, and I actually got to be one of the, um, proofreaders for that book that he wrote where he, he shared with more edge and just seeing myself in that, I'm like, Oh yeah, I'm, I'm definitely my father's son, <laughs> but also, um, you know, seeing the, the areas and the things in which he, um, he really, yeah, he really did make some, some sacrifices for the family and, and for his own benefit as well where in, in some of his his younger days weren't as productive as uh you know in terms of, of the things that really matter and he had to make some some shifts and and that happened for him as well so definitely definitely look up to and respect my father for everything that he taught me um and then i've had yeah i've had coaches and teachers just over the years that you know, reflected things back to me about myself. I had a, an instructor in college, actually. I was in a year of taking a business and professional speech class. And it's really what kind of got me, if you will, to speaking and sharing and, and using my voice, uh, business professional speech class. And I was giving a, a you know, presentation for class. It was one of these things that you get a grade for. But he pointed out to me that when it came to sharing whatever it was that I was, I was talking about and I, I knew my stuff, he was like, you just, you have this confidence and you have this projection and you have this, this stage presence and he's like, you put a little fast, but when, you, when you're up here, you own the stage. He said in so many words and that stuck with me for so long. And that's really shaped, I feel a lot of how I like to show up, whether it's here in the podcast space or on a stage somewhere, or even in a one-on-one -on -one coaching session, just knowing that um, communication is, is key and, and, and it made me a lover of communication. And for as many people as hate public speaking and get stage fright and all those kinds of things, yeah, you know, the butterflies still come and show up. And, and there's that, you know, what if kind of question that, that comes for everyone but it really cultivated in me a love of sharing my voice and using my voice for good. Yeah, and you, you do have that, that presence, that confidence, and as, especially like when coming onto this particular show, I know with a lot of podcasts, the, the, the questions are discussed beforehand, but here I've just been throwing shit at you and you're just like calmly, oh yeah, this, this. <laughs> it's just, it really shows that you know your stuff. Yeah. For sure. I'm like, okay, we didn't, we, none, of it, none of this is scripted. If you're watching the recording or, uh, or later on, wherever this goes out, yeah, this was very um, organic. Mm -hmm. Okay, so we have a question from Lady Kavita. I'm going to promote her to the panel so we can see her. There she is. Okay, unmute. There's the camera. Hi, unmute, please. There she is. Can I do that? Oh, I sure. have to. Okay. okay. <laughs> and the world is changing fast and faster. I really appreciate the conversation, both you and uh, both of you guys. And so I think 
racism is a big topic these days. And it seems like I am feeling the, the negative energy of racism. It's not, I mean, I've lived in the United States most of my life, but all of a sudden in the past four or five years, the energy of racism is just like an explosion in my face. And so uh, is it, there's more racism now or I just didn't notice it uh, before, if that makes sense. It, it makes sense, not, not the question that that was gonna come up. <laughs> yeah, that's a great question. And <laughs> No, that's a great question. And thank you for asking it. I think one of the things that we have to, to thank for that, I'll say, is, is the rise of social media. Because until the last five to 10 years, all of our, our input, our news, which fun fact, this is a freebie, news is an acronym for notable events, weather and sports. Anyway, we, were, we would get news. We would turn on the TV, we turn on the radio, and we would hear, this is what's going on. And now we have social media where everyone wants to be an expert. They should come on my show. Um, but everyone has an act to grind. Everyone has an opinion. Everyone has an experience. And so now, rather than receiving some news headline of, you know, oh, there was this racially motivated crime, let's say, um, or, or maybe people in this area, um, you know, there, there's some genocide happening, let's say, God forbid, you know, in which we've seen throughout history, racially motivated. And, and, and we feel kind of distant from it, like, okay, well, that's bad. That happened to those people halfway around the world. You know, we saw it in Rwanda. We saw it in World War II. It's what, you know, the Holocaust, all this kind of a thing. And, and we would see these on this large scale. But we, we kind of weren't really aware of like how it's next door, right? We, we weren't having conversations around like, oh no, this is how, this is what my experience was as a, a black woman or a Mexican man or a, a Native American or an Asian in, in, in any given part of the world. And so with the rise of social media, everyone has a voice now. And we're able to see that more prevalently on the grand scale, now it's coming more in the conversation. We're realizing, okay, this is a lot of this is a lot more embedded in in our culture than we realize. And then the, I, I would say the um, the opposition, so to speak, to to the conversation itself around racism comes from honestly a lack of desire to really acknowledge it. The, the whole, well, you know, you know, I'm not racist, so it's not important to me, yeah. right? Or, or I've never been discriminated against, so I don't really have to worry about it. And besides, I have friends that are Asian and African and, mm -hmm. you know, Mexican, so I, I can't be racist, you know, and, and we, we paint it over with this brush and let's don't look over there. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's kind of where, um, where I see, we, that is becoming more of the conversation and some of the, the issues that I'm seeing with how we're dealing with it. Yeah, I saw a quote from Will Smith recently. Does that answer your question? Yes. Yes, thank you so much. I really appreciate it. Uh, so it's really the, uh, we are being inundated at a very fast pace because of the social media, the uh, the technology that's supposed to be helping us is al also basically uh, exploding in our mind all the things going on at, at once. And so, of course, it's going to be negative energy. So, so thank you. Right. And it's, and it's not just racism we're hearing about as well, right? It's there's, you know, everything, right? There's the, the Canadian genocide. There's the, uh, you know, the issues with... Um, you know, the LGBT um, people and, and how they've been discriminated against and just all these different kinds of things. And then the whole political spectrum, there's so, so much information coming in that, you know, okay, what may be the biggest headline for you may be racism. You're also being fed, if you will, you, you, this information is coming into you um, about all these other things going on, this political headline, this person said that, 
you know, this celebrity is, is experiencing this in the news, like all these different kinds of things are coming in. So, um, yeah, it's, it's, it's a lot to take in. And that kind of goes back to what I was sharing earlier about how we take care of ourselves. How, how much time do we give ourselves to unplug and to reconnect with ourselves, with our higher power, with God, with the earth, with the people around us, and um, make sure that we are, are being nourished in a way that's helpful for us and that will improve the impact that we get to have um, here in the time that we've been given. Well, thank you. And I think Shiraz, you were just about to quote Will Smith. Well, there was a quote from Will Smith that said, racism isn't growing, it's just being filmed now. So ah, okay. exactly what, uh, what he was saying, which, which Josiah was saying, it's just, there's a greater awareness of it. You just didn't realize how prevalent it was before. I remember when the Me Too movement started out and the people on my Facebook page, the, all the girls were putting the Me Too. And I, I expected somewhere around 30% to have that hashtag that like there's there's the hashtag to support it, but then to that, they, the post that it actually happened to them, I expected the actually happened to be about 30%. And it was like 80 to 90%. I was like, oh my God, like mm -hmm. <laughs> what the hell is going on? I was completely unaware, but now it's just, it's out there how bad things have been. And it's the, the cool thing is because of this exposure, the awareness grows and overall things are starting to change. There's less racism now, even though it seems like there's more because it's being exposed. Okay. Yeah, and, and it, it, uh, thanks for bringing that up, Sharad, because it, it brought back something I wanted to add. When um, you said these platforms and these opportunities to, to share our, our message and our truth on these things are supposed to be there for good, but you feel like there's there's a lot of negative that's coming from it. And that's, that's really the best metaphor I can think of is when you put antiseptic on an open cut, <laughs> you have to feel the pain to be able to do something about it. We have to realize that like, yes, there's this really serious issue and people are really being discriminated against in this way. And that this is really bad. This is horrible. It's all these things. Because one of the things that I found as someone who is, specializes in passion um, is that the things that anger us are the things that we take action on and they drive our passions. If we're, it, very often, if let's just pick something arbitrary, animal cruelty, right? Mm -hmm. We all, we all know that it exists. We know it's out there, but until you've actually seen someone abusing their animal, you've seen, you know, your neighbor's dog on a chain all day in the heat, you know, they're, they're broken down, they're emaciated, like it's a very upsetting experience, you know, and at some point you want just want to go next door and, you know, teach someone a lesson. And it's, but it, and it's that anger at the injustice that's being performed that drives us to make change. And that could be externally with, with racism, with sexual assault with me too with genocide you know all these different kinds of things and it can also be in the, when we actually turn around and look into ourselves like oh where is where does that reside in me you know am i angry enough if you will at you know my unhealthy eating habits I'm hating my body i'm just saying i have unhealthy eating habits maybe and i can see how that's playing out and, and until that, until I get fed up, no pun intended, with those unhealthy habits, I'm not going to change. So until the pain of, of what's going on is greater than the pain of doing nothing, or until, I'm not saying that right. <laughs> <laughs> until the pain of doing nothing is greater than the pain of change, then we will continue to do nothing. So, um, I, and it's, it doesn't sound exciting, but we have to embrace that pain and embrace that, that displeasure and discomfort of um, seeing these things brought to light. And yes, you know, mourn with the people who have been marginalized and victimized and 
and all of this and let that fuel your passion to the change. Wow. Well, that is a wonderful way to end the show. <laughs> Thank you for that. Okay, I'm going to let you go, Lady Kavita. Thank you. Thank you so much for such a beautiful question. Great. All right, and we're going to close up. But first, if people want to get in contact with you, what do they do? Is it that coaching at Sharpshooter or are there other ways? They can, they can email me there. Yeah, they can find me on Facebook, um, Defy David Cooper on Facebook, find me on Instagram um, at Cooper the Climber, Climber spelt with a Y because hashtag millennial. Um, <laughs> my new leadership consulting, uh, in construction is leap.consulting, L-E-A-P.consulting. They can find me there. Um, and yeah, reach out, shoot me a message, connect with me. Um, I would love to just see what's going on for you. And if there's shit that you're wanting to make in life, if there's traction you want to gain, reach out to me. And um, I'm just so grateful for the opportunity to talk about all the things really um, in this very unscripted organic conversation here with you Shiraz. Oh, oh it's been great and for people that might be listening on a podcast later the email address that we're referring to is coaching at sharpshooterenterprises.com that you can reach him at along with everything else he just said <laughs> and so so if you can't get in touch with them you're you have a lot of blocks going on <laughs> and you've got to get through those so you can get get working with them Every time it's raw to deal with the block, then come talk to me. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So thank you so much for being on. This has been a great session. And I will see you at the future networking events. And do you have any final words of wisdom, something to say, advice for the audience before we shut it all down? Mm. So many, so little time. Mm -hmm. um, be you. And to be you, you might need to take some time to get to know you. Cool. And when you, at, along that journey, give yourself permission to express yourself, what you want, what you need, how you want to connect with other people, how you want to show up in the world. Because as we said, we only have this life for sure to live. And we don't know how many days we have to count down. So make it what you want it to be and live life fully expressed. Wow. All right. Thank you again for being on the show and to the audience listening. Thank you for listening. Thank you for watching. We'll be back again next month with another guest. And until then, be well. Oh, wait. Don't forget to watch the other shows on the Break Breakthrough uh, Network, like Ask Crystal and the Main Breakthrough Show. And, you know, we're on their network. We should promote what's going on in the network. <laughs> Hi, Jessica. Okay. <laughs> and, and now, once you've gone and checked that out, be well, be aware, and be magical. Thank you, guys. Bye-bye.